I'm Josh Escovito with Weintraub Tobin. And I'm Scott Hervey from Weintraub Tobin. The hyperactivity of influencer deals this past December got me thinking about a case many are going to keep their eye on, a case that for now has a model and influencer, Molly Sims, on the hook for trademark infringement, all because of a sponsored post she did for a beauty product, which another cosmetic company claims infringes its trademark. We're going to talk about this on the next installment of The Briefing by the IP Law Blog. The case is Petunia Products versus Rodan and Fields, which by most accounts, Josh, is a run-of-the-mill trademark case. Rodan and Fields manufactures and sells a beauty product. Petunia claims that the name that Rodan and Fields gave its new beauty product infringes its trademark, and Petunia sues Rodan and Fields for trademark infringement. The twist in this case is that Petunia Products also sued Molly Sims, an actress and a social media influencer who had been hired by Rodan and Fields to create and post content on her blog promoting their product. I remember reading about this case last year. The plaintiff is a cosmetics company doing business as Billion Dollar Brows, and it owns the trademark Brow Boost, which it registered in 2006. The defendant is also a cosmetics company, and it created its own brow product called Brow Defining Boost, which it launched in mid-2020. As part of Rodan and Fields' rollout, it launched an influencer marketing campaign in which it hired Sims to post a review of the product on her blog. Sims' blog post acknowledged that the review was sponsored, as she's required to do per the FTC guidelines, and she included a link to Rodan's website. Petunia sued both Rodan and Fields and Sims for trademark infringement and other related claims. And as you may also remember, Josh, uh, Sims moved to dismiss the claims for direct and contributory trademark infringement. And while the judge granted Sims's motion, uh, as to the claim for contributory infringement, it left standing the claim for direct infringement. Now, in the Ninth Circuit, in order to establish direct trademark infringement, a plaintiff has to establish the use of its mark by the defendant in commerce and a likelihood of confusion. The judge found that the plaintiff had adequately pled that the blog post is likely to cause confusion as to the source of Rodan and Fields' product and that Sims's post was essentially advertising, thereby satisfying the use and commerce requirement. Now, Sims raised some arguments why her use would not constitute trademark infringement as a matter of law, including that the blog post was non-commercial editorial speech. The court said that because this was paid content, it crossed the line from editorial or consumer commentary to commercial use. At this early stage where the court is just looking at the pleadings and determining whether as a matter of law, there is without a question or defense or some pleading deficiency, I can see why the court would deny Sims' motion. There are some potential defenses that don't fit the fact pattern neatly, but probably should be looked into. For example, Sims should explore whether the Rogers test applies. Although the Rogers test generally applies to creative works, and this is advertorial content, uh, it's not clear to me, that a court would say that as a matter of law, advertorial content isn't a creative work. Right. And 15 U.S.C. section 1114 2B quite possibly may limit Sims' ultimate liability to only injunctive relief, assuming that she's an innocent infringer. Also, I'm sure that given who she is, she had legal counsel on her deal and is being indemnified by Rodan and Fields. However, this should be a cautionary tale for the talent side of the influencer marketing industry. If you are a bigger, better known influencer, you're likely going to be a target for a claim like this. So you better be sure to obtain indemnity from the brand. That's an excellent point. Along those lines, since indemnity is only as good as the indemnitor's pockets are deep, it may be a good idea to avoid startup companies or sketchy offshore entities. This certainly is a case to watch this year. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Josh. Thanks for tuning into this installment of The Briefing by the IP Law Blog. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and podcast. And if you're interested in additional content, visit our website at theiplawblog.com. Thank you. <laughs>